perfection. I'm looking for the perfect city. Five billion people live in cities, and what I want to know is whether brain science can do anything to make them a little more perfect for them. The last 50 years, in fact, the last 30 years saw a revolution in understanding about the brain. Used to be thought that it was fixed in place by age three or four. Now it's clear that our brains are plastic, being constantly changed by experiences we have and the environments we live in. And cities change us. Now, how do they change us, you might ask? Well, one very simple way is they make us walk faster. The bigger the city, the faster the average walking speed. So here's my question for you today. Do they make us think faster? Do they make us think better? Do they, in other words, change our brains? Why would I think that? Well, the great Russian psychologist Luria and Vygotsky in the 1930s studied the mental function of people who were moving from very small rural communities into cities. And they noticed the remarkable changes in their mental functions and their cognitive functions and the way they thought, their level of abstraction of their thinking. Now, cities are places where people with different outlooks and different perspectives and different cultures meet together. Can I ask, how many of you in this audience have spent time living in a different culture from the one in which you're living now? You put up your hand. Yeah. On average, you will be more creative than people who have only lived in a single culture. And what cities do is they bring different perspectives together. And this is the heart of innovation, the heart of creativity, when different perspectives on life, on problems meet. So is there any evidence then that cities make us more creative? There is. Here we have the proportion of super creative employment by metropolitan population. And that's people in the scientific, artistic, educational, and uh, entertainment profession. So here we have suggestion that cities change our brains. So how might they do that? Well, what do people come to cities for? Why this huge drift to the cities? Success. The search for success. A new job or a job. A new business. Trying to make a name in music or art, going to a college or university to do a degree. People are looking for success, and success is the greatest changer of the brain that mankind has ever known. And what's the greatest ingredient of success? Success! <laughs> and this is the glorious feedback loop of the great city that success engenders success. Why would that happen? Well, the answer is the winner effect. The winner effect is a term in biology which means if you set one animal to compete with a weakened opponent, and he wins, of course, he's more likely to win a second game or match against a strong opponent. And this applies to humans as well. And American boxing promoters have known about this for centuries, long before any pointy-headed scientists came across it. And it benefited Mike Tyson when he came out of jail after three years for rape. Because Don King set him up with a very important experience that would change his brain. Tomato cans, for some reason I've never been able to find out, is the American boxing term for weakened opponents that you give your would-be champ to fight before the really big match. So here was Tyson's first tomato can. Poor old Peter McNeely from Boston Irishman. 
And what happened? 89 seconds. The second tomato can was Buster Mathis Jr. a couple of months later, Philadelphia. He lasted three rounds, but there was a sad sight. His third match, nine months later, was against Frank Bruno, the reigning champion, the Londoner, and he demolished Frank Bruno. His brain had been changed by success. And so, the way this works is that any contest you have, it could be a chess match, it doesn't have to be fighting. Any contest you have, male or female, your testosterone rises in response to the challenge of the contest. The more it rises, the more likely you are to win it. And testosterone has a very important effect and generates and increases the activity of dopamine, which is a critical chemical messenger in the brain. And dopamine is the medium of success. Now, any time you get a pay rise or paid a compliment, have sex, have a pint or a gin and tonic, take cocaine or have success, <laughs> or all six if you like, Every time you do that, that feel-good factor you have, and I've never taken cocaine, so I just have to take people's words for it, the feel-good factor that you have is mediated by a common pathway in the brain, which is a dopamine pathway deep in the middle of the brain. And that's the reward network. And success switches that on. But dopamine has other very important effects in the brain because it's critical, particularly for the functioning of the front part of the brain, the frontal lobes, which are critical for motivation, for focus, for setting goals. So that's why success not only makes us more bold and feel better, it's a bit of an antidepressant and a bit of an anti-anxiety drug, it also makes us a bit smarter. So that's one reason how cities change us by success experiences, of course not for everyone. Some people have bad experiences in cities, but in general, people go to cities because there's a chance of success. And success makes you feel good, and it makes you smarter. So why else do cities change our brains? Well, can you think of a time when you've maybe arrived somewhere and you realize you have no memory of getting there? Stop your hands if you can think of a situation. I'm, I'm very absent-minded. So that's you, an automatic pilot. Your attention hasn't been on what you're doing. But attention is critical for problem solving, for creativity, for new ideas. And if our minds are wandering all the time, sometimes we will not see things that would otherwise help us spark off new ideas. And cities, of important effects on our attention via a very critical separate factor from success. Novelty. Novelty in mice triggers new brain cells to grow and improves memory. We don't know in humans if it does this, but novelty has its effects by a second chemical messenger in the brain called noradrenaline or norepinephrine in America. And this is a remarkable substance. It's a bit of a brain fertilizer. It makes the plastic changes in your brain with experience happen more easily and more quickly. So it makes, helps learning. It helps memory as well. So the novelty of the city, the fact that often you are surprised by things you did not expect to see, compared to a smaller community where things are more predictable. And of course you get creativity from small rural areas also. I'm not saying this is all the feature of the city, but cities are cauldrons of creativity. And novelty is a big factor in changing the brains of people. And maybe this is one reason why people in mentally stimulating jobs are less likely statistically to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease later in life, possibly because 
the novelty of that stimulating job has bathed their brains in noradrenaline for many years. That's a hypothesis. There's a downside, though. And we need to ask Goldilocks about that. Because Goldilocks didn't like her porridge too cold, and she didn't like it too hot, and she didn't like her bed too hard, and she didn't like it too soft. Things had to be just right for Goldilocks. And our brains are like that as well, particularly for our two favorite chemical messengers, noradrenaline and dopamine. Too little of either of these drugs, and our brains underfunction. Too much, and they underfunction. So if we're too laid back and too relaxed, you know, we don't really come up with the mental goods. And on the other hand, if we're overstressed and we're over demands made on us, we get poor performance for different reasons. So here's the perfect city. The perfect city will keep us in the Goldilocks zone. So there is a third thing that affects our brains in the city, and not always for the good. And that is other people. What's the most stressful thing? What's the greatest stress in our life? Is it financial worries? Is it health worries? Is it fear of death? Is it fear of burglary or attack? I could go on, but no. Sally Dickerson in California has shown the biggest stressor is called social evaluative threat, the fear of the negative opinion of others. Charles Darwin identified this. He, he said the emotion in question is shame, and it relates entirely to you, the judgment of others. If you're a baboon, the biggest stress you can have, as measured by how much of the stress hormone cortisol is pumped into your blood, is to have your social rank diminished. So cities, with all these walking faster and thinking faster and all this competition and other people succeeding and maybe you don't, there's a lot of fear of the negative opinions of others and the views of others, particularly where there are social hierarchies. And Eric Vesselman and his colleagues in Purdue University did a beautiful study looking at strangers walking down the street and one of their researchers would walk by the stranger and either meet their eye or just miss their eye. They would look in their general direction, but they wouldn't look at them, they would blank them. The Germans have a phrase for this, wie Luft behandeln, to, to look at as though air. And what they, they did then, they did this with a hundred or so strangers, and then they had one of the researchers immediately go to that stranger and say, excuse me, and ask them a couple of questions. And what they found was, the people who had been blanked reported they felt significantly more disconnected. And the people who had met the eye felt more connected, even if they had never had any awareness of the eye contact. So the risk is, in terms of changing our brains, that the cities provide us with multiple little episodes of shame, in Charles Darwin's terms. Multiple little exclusions, mini exclusions, that, if you like, maybe stress us or demoralize us and tip us out of the Goldilocks zone of our optimal functioning. So what do we do about this? Well, I'm setting up a perfect cities challenge to you all here. I've come up with four ideas that I'm going to present to you now. Let's have success markets or dopamine markets. These are places where successful people who have made some success in some area go and generously offer to give a success experience to someone else. It could be a musical instrument, it could be a business plan, it could be social skills, it could be anything. And maybe people exchange with each other. But everyone has to leave this market with something, and that is a little extra dopamine in the reward system. Let's have novelty benches. Designated areas where strangers choose to sit down and impart some surprise or novelty within limits to the people beside them. <laughs> Tell them something, you know, I just thought this, or do you know this once happened to me? And people exchange ideas to make the, the city more interesting. We might have Goldilocks tents 
For the people that are jaded and bored and in a kind of mindless haze because they don't like their job or they don't have a job and, and life seems very gray, put them in a red Goldilocks tent to push them up into the Goldilocks zone with music, with smells, with, with, with other people who are looking to, 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 to energize themselves. And finally, we could have nod zones. <laughs> Streets, Grafton Street, Henry Street, that are designated as places where there's little nod signs where you say, look, in this street, we would like you to acknowledge strangers. Not everyone, but acknowledge some strangers. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Meet their eyes, not too threateningly. But the perfect city is about harnessing the winner effect to maximize the potential of people to get the most out of lives and to be creative and innovative in solving the incredible problems of a very crowded but very wonderful world. Now, I've been in Dublin for 13 wonderful years. I think I've probably found pretty near the perfect city. Dublin has, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there are nod zones in Dublin. <laughs> Definitely a couple of novelty benches. <laughs> Definitely. And I can think of a couple of Goldilocks tents as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.